Hello, uh, this is Alan Lumsden. I'm in the Dubuque CV Live Studios, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Darren Schneider, who joins us from Cornell uh, Vascular Surgery. Uh, he actually happens to be the division chief there, and he gave a talk this morning on current status of endovascular thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair. So we'll touch a little bit about that. First of all, welcome, Darren. Thank you very much for coming down to the wild, wild west. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. So before we talk about um, the subject of your presentation this morning, let me kind of pick your brains, because people are always interested in how did you get to yeah. where you are? And I know there are certainly areas of the United States where great innovation in vascular surgery could Rochester was an example, um, and UCSF was another. So tell me a little bit about yeah. how you ended up at UCSF and how important that early experience was to where you are at the moment. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I mean, I think a lot of it's serendipity and and being being in the right place at the right time. I uh, uh, I initially didn't want to go to UCSF. I kind of ended up there by accident, and it turned out to be a wonderful thing. And uh, there was really a lot of. I mean, it was one of the pioneering general surgery training programs. Also, you know, the first real vascular surgery fellowship in terms of uh, 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 Edwin Wiley got the first certificate. Uh, in uh, added qualifications, board certification in vascular surgery, and he was the one who had started the, uh, the department there. That was before I got there. Uh, and then vascular surgery, again, got lucky. Right place, right time. While I was a trainee, Tim Tudor uh, got brought on board, and of course he's one of the real innovators in vascular surgery and endovascular surgery. And then it just so happened that, that they offered me the opportunity to stay there after general surgery to train in vascular surgery. And they had this idea that uh, as vascular surgery needed to incorporate training for endovascular, that they would do it by allowing you to do an, or providing you with an <laughs> IR fellowship. So I had that opportunity to do an IR fellowship. And so to be honest, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, the right people were there. And then you just have to recognize that and then take advantage of those opportunities. So no master plan. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say it was a master yeah. plan. Yeah, I think that's true of most people. Yeah. To be honest with you, I've always thought that, you know, you exactly what you've said is you do a good job. Yeah. People help you, and and you see opportunities which come along, and you got to be able to recognize, you know, what those opportunities can lead to. Yeah, well, it's having good mentors and people who care about you and people who have some vision for you know what the future you know may hold and then creating opportunities that you can take advantage. And I think it's really recognizing that advantage. I knew immediately when they started describing this opportunity to do a, a, a full year IR fellowship in addition to a full vascular so fellowship. So who created that? Because that's remarkable. Yeah. You know, I, I, a lot of these things happen. I think that, that what happened was, was uh, Lou Messina was the chief at the time, and he brought Tim Tudor on board. And, and that and was he came from Rochester. No, well, he at that time he was at Columbia. He okay. initially trained in Rochester. Rochester. Yep. He he'd done an IR fellowship. He went to Malmo, Sweden, um, worked with Crossy yeah. in Sweden, and then came back and was on faculty at Columbia uh, in New York City. And then um, Lou Messina recruited him to uh, UCSF to start the endovascular program, and and really he was kind of you know the. I don't know, I guess the seminal event for radiology and other people who sometimes get threatened in these turf wars. And so their, their immediate response, which was actually great for me, was to say, well, uh, they recognized that Tim was coming, they viewed him as a little mm. bit of a threat, and the way to kind of stem that mm. threat was to say, well, let's have an arrangement where vascular surgery really doesn't take over the things that were traditionally done in IR and in exchange we will provide training for all the vascular fellows. Now that, that was a uh, a relationship that I don't think had a long-term end game, but I got to take advantage of that in, in my training. That lasted for five years and then kind of dissolved and then we incorporated all the endovascular training into the vascular program itself as it became a formal two-year program. So you then stayed on after your fellowship. I stayed so you on. did a vascular fellowship, the general surgery, yes. a vascular fellowship. An IR fellowship. Yes. Okay. Yeah. IR first, on. then vascular, yeah. and then uh, and then I stayed on on faculty, and at the time had dual appointments in both radiology and in uh, and in vascular surgery. 
So you have to drain the, the, the pus and the abscesses and stick needles in gallbladders? Uh, yes. So that was part of the training. And actually, I think yep. that that was beneficial because, you know, people in other fields and specialties have access to tools that we don't use routinely in vascular surgery. But it's all kind of image-guided catheter guide mm -hmm. wire stuff. So you develop skills that you're going to use in your practice no matter whether you're draining pus or right. you're putting in a nephrostomy tube. And then you also recognize some of these tools that are used for other things that maybe you get the light bulb goes off and that you could use one of these things in a vascular application yep. or start thinking of why don't we have a vascular tool like this uh, to play with. So uh, I think it was valuable and, and yeah so early on when initially I was working in both places with my initial appointment I'd take IR call and you'd come mm -hmm. in and you'd you know drain a septic biliary system you'd do a tips in the middle of the night uh, in addition to the vascular work, and so uh, I think it was. I think it was good. I think I, I learned and gained a lot from that experience. I don't do that anymore. I'm pretty yeah. much exclusively focused on vascular work. It's interesting. When I, when I was at Baylor here, um, we had the opportunity because the, the IR group at the VA imploded, and they asked us to take it over. And you know, yeah, we can do that kind of thing. Yeah. It was it, it was a mistake actually because. Yeah. The vascular guys don't really want to be doing that. And I'm not arguing that they're not valuable tips and tricks. You can certainly learn from that. But it was a little disruptive. Nobody really wants to come in on the weekend to put in a cholecystostomy tube. If it was a cold leg, hey, yeah, they, they yeah. kind of recognize that. But uh, I'm very interested in this idea of the other guy's toolkit and what other people yes. have. And one of the things I advocate is go in somebody else's operating room or, or I, who, people who I learn from are the neuroradiologists, actually. I'm a good friend of mine, works down there and I always learn from working with them. Yeah, I totally agree. So mm -hmm. I've seen some of the wires and access catheters and coils and things initially that the neuro IR guys were working with that we didn't see in the periphery and they weren't even being, you know, offered to us. But you could see that there could be utility yep. for a lot of those things and things that we do. I think the same is true with, the, with, with cardiology. A lot yep. of the you know, low profile wire systems, uh, CTOs, the work we do in tibials and pedal vessels uh, um, um, comes from the, the coronary field. So watching those people and some of their wire skills and, their, and seeing what tools they have and then seeing how you could translate mm -hmm. to your practice I think is valuable. So, so then you moved. What's that? Even then you moved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I moved. So I spent almost 10 years in uh, San Francisco on faculty. And then, uh, again, I think it's the you know serendipity, the right opportunity comes available. I had a great practice, very happy, great group in San Francisco. Still, you know, love staying in contact and going back to, uh, to visit there. But there was this uh, leadership opportunity in, in New York. And um, I think an opportunity to really try to, to kind of rebuild the, the program there because it had kind of, uh, there had been some attrition, it had kind of uh, gone down a little bit in kind of the interim period after Craig Kent left. And so that was an opportunity. I mean, it's a great institution, yeah. uh, great medical college, uh, has reputation, has great location, has incredible people there. So it was kind of a no-brainer that you could take that yeah. job and then build it back uh, into something uh, really impressive. And, and not by myself, I mean, with a lot of people yeah. uh, who, were, who were helping me to do that. All right. So let's go on and talk about what you talked about this morning. Sure. Um, Basically, the summary was you're heavily involved in a number of the trials and you have your own IDE for uh, branched and fenestrated uh, devices for treatment of thoracic abdominal aneurysms. So, go forward in four or five years. And where do you think this technology is going to be? Well, I, I think it's going to get better and better. I mean, even in the four or five years since we started our trial, I mean, it's really morphed into something and involved in, into something different than the way we started, the way we do access, the way we design the graphs, lower profile uh, devices and delivery systems. Concept, uh, and I didn't discuss that this morning, of uh, preloaded catheter and wire systems to really make these procedures faster. And then I think the other thing is that, that it's just getting started, I think is really kind of the image guidance uh, aspect mm -hmm. of this. I mean, we think that we're sophisticated, you know, doing some fusion imaging, but that's really not that sophisticated. Um, and I think that the image guidance is just gonna, gonna explode and really change the way we do this stuff. And I think that it's gotta come to the point also where we're really reducing radiation exposure, mm -hmm. where there's navigation guidance, robotics. I think that, that we're gonna start seeing that over the next five to 10 years uh, for sure that is really gonna dramatically transform this field. 
So one of the questions that was sent in is, and to quote it, is one of the biggest problems in FIVAR and EVAR is disease progression, which leads to patients coming back for further re-intervention, especially in FIVAR. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's true. And I don't know that it's just disease progression. So I think that when we have the capability with the advanced fenestrated and branch devices, not the currently commercially available ones, you know, we can do this so that you can go to healthy aorta, that you can have a four centimeter long landing zone, that you're actually, you know, planning for failure if it should occur, that it's easy to cuff up using a modular approach and not have to reconstruct that visceral segment again. So I think that that's a key concept and different than some of just the juxtarenal fenestrated stuff that's been done that certainly can fail and fail in a bad way if there's progression of aneurysmal disease. The other aspect I think is the bridging stent technology to mm -hmm. go into the visceral mm -hmm. arteries. And you know, early on a lot of our branch related problems with patency and maybe even endoleaks because we just didn't have you know purpose-built devices to do that mm -hmm. and we were using fluency and ICAST stents and things that are relatively rigid and not necessarily tested or designed for uh, for you know peripheral vascular use and now we're getting some some newer products there's now a host of uh, balloon expandable covered stents there's like the VBX device that's flexible as well and deliverable. Um, uh, so I think as that technology evolves as well, I think the branch related problems are gonna decrease. And, and we've learned a lot. I mean, we had some initial issues with say, type 1C endo leaks mm -hmm. uh, around branches, uh, modular disconnections with the bridging stent and the aortic stent graft. And, and we've learned from that. So we maximize our overlap. We make sure that we have appropriate oversizing. We extend as, you know, oftentimes as far distally as we can into a target visceral artery to get a more stable and uh, durable result. So I think we're gonna figure it out, but it's that process of, of, of you know, doing the cases, doing it in a responsible way where we're tracking our outcomes and actually doing research and learning as we do it uh, so that we can employ those learnings in the future to make it better, and, and we're gonna get there. Well, two things that really fascinated me in your presentation. Um, one was the use of NEARS, and so let me just summarize so everybody understands in, in my understanding of it. You put NEARS, sen infrared sensors, on the paraspinous muscles at two different levels. Correct. And the assumption being, or the implication is that the, because the spinal cord perfusion is segmental, that a change in the NEARS overlying the paraspinous muscles in theory should reflect a change in uh, perfusion of the spinal cord. Now, I'd never heard of that before. So, can you elaborate a little bit about yeah. where this idea came from and yeah. where you are in validation? You, you got it exactly right. I didn't show you some of our data that we're now collecting. The original idea uh, we got from Christian Etz, and it was research work that he was doing in Randy Greep's lab at Mount Sinai in New York on the importance of segmental perfusion to the, to the spinal cord. And that's where concepts of staging repairs and uh, maybe uh, taking out some of the lumbars or intercostals to encourage patients to compensate and develop uh, mm -hmm. collateral circulation and really demonstrating also the concept that you can develop collateral circulation to the spinal cord if you're given enough time before it's radically changed. So he was doing work in the animal experiments using NEARS looking at this concept of spinal cord collateral network perfusion and the perfusion to the uh, uh, muscles that are adjacent, the paraspinous mm -hmm. muscles being a, you know, a really reliable surrogate for spinal cord um, um, perfusion. And there actually is a whole series of animal experiments where they did, where they okay. actually showed that it was an accurate reflector. Since then, he's moved back to uh, Germany. He's at the University of Leipzig. And, uh, and has started using it in his clinical practice. And there was a, you know, kind of a proof of concept paper with a series of patients who had open thoracoabdominal aneurysm repairs that he monitored with NEARS and showed that you could actually demonstrate the changes with cross clamping and reperfusion uh, that would and predict the patients that were gonna have a problem. And so we thought, well, it's a much cleaner system with endovascular, right? We don't have on pump, off pump, we're not cooling, we're not cross clamping. So we really should be just looking at perfusion yeah. changes. 
changes. Yeah. And instead of doing evoke potentials like people do, which are, are really overly sensitive, they change in like 80% of the patients, but it, we're not sure what that means, subject to you know, leg ischemia and things like that in terms of the interpretation, that, that maybe NEARS would be a non-invasive way that we could do this. It also has the potential, which I didn't talk about, that you just put the sensors on, it's like an O2 saturation sensor or sticker, you know, you could continue that in the post-operative period as well if your patient's intubated in the ICU. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting also. So we've started doing that. We've done probably about 70 consecu consecutive patients where we've done NEARS monitoring. And we do put the sensors over the bilateral uh, lower lumbar paraspinous muscles, and then we put some reference sensors over the upper thoracic paraspinous muscles as a reference because mm -hmm. those shouldn't necessarily uh, uh, change. And if we see a change from baseline or reference of uh, more than 20% when we occlude the final branch to oh. stop flow into the aneurysm sac, then we have the option that we could leave that branch incomplete and maintain spinal cord perfusion, so kind of that staged approach to repair that Randy Grieb had talked about. So we found so far, and actually we presented last year at the um, uh, Eastern Vascular uh, Society, um, the initial experience combined Leipzig, Mayo Clinic, and Cornell with over 100 patients. And we found that it's not as sensitive for spinal cord ischemia as evoke potentials but it's much, much, much more specific. If you see a change, it's real. Yeah. If you don't see anything, you're not totally sure. Um, but it looks like it may be a useful tool. We're still trying to figure that out. Though. Fascinating. The last thing was the percutaneous axillary uh, access. Um, yeah. So pretty interesting. So we still end up doing cut downs and put the conduit on there. So should we quit doing that and move to percutaneous puncture? I think so. But I, I think you have to do it the right way and the safe way. And so we can, and definitely I want to educate people on how we do it. Um, there is a learning curve with that. We were doing everything with axillary cut downs and conduits, mm -hmm. and it works great. Mm -hmm. But it's not without risk and time, and you can have ongoing oozing while the patient's uh, heparinized. And then we've also seen, not, you know, fortunately not in our cases, but, you know, patients who have had conduits and there's a little prosthetic material and then the thing gets infected and then you got to deal with that too. So I think the, the percutaneous approach definitely has some utility and we've shown that we can do it safely. We, we, we published that initial experience that I showed you with uh, a series of 46 patients that we had treated and, and now we're probably upwards close to 100 patients. Mm -hmm. There is a learning curve. We had uh, uh, two patients with some neurologic issues uh, mm. early on, but it was in the first 15 patients we treated and we haven't had one since. And those were transient paresthesias, not a permanent neurologic uh, uh, injury. Um, but really, I mean, the technical success is similar to what it is for yeah. percutaneous femoral access. And, and the concept that, you know, maybe we can get to the point where if we're doing these cases fast enough and slick enough, maybe we don't need general anesthesia. Yeah. We yeah. could do them percutaneously under local and sedation and really, you know, make I think remarkable, you know, treating a type 2 thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm percutaneously without a general anesthetic. I mean, who, who thought that we yeah, could do that? Wild. Crazy. So tell me about your research setup. Who, who helps you with all, collect all this data? That's what I really <laughs> want to know. <laughs> well, uh, we can use all the help we can get yeah. if anybody uh, wants to help us with that. Um, we, we did start, um, and it is expensive, so we did start really, uh, there are two things. So I had an institutional commitment where they, mm -hmm. uh, agreed with the value that this would bring to the institution and that this is a, a worthwhile thing to do. So, you know, we do take some money out of the Department of Surgery and we do have some input from the hospital as well to help offset the cost of, say, a research coordinator. So mm -hmm. it's not a great amount of help. But there's additional things when you're doing kind of an IDE study, right? We've got to have a, uh, uh, a compliant EDC system. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily cheap to build, mm -hmm. um, although a lot of institutions do have resources, REDCap and things, where you can do that. You have to have external monitoring, a DSMB that you have to set up. So all these things come with some price. And then as you accumulate patients, and now we're going to follow patients for five years, it's not just the the 100 or 200 patients you're going to treat, it's going to be ongoing periodic follow-up for that large cohort of patients for over a five-year period of time. So it, the, the expenses do increase with time. And so 
you know, we've had some philanthropic donations that we've helped use to support this. We've had that institutional support for our research coordinator, but really that's it. It's, it's a little bit of a bare bones operation. Um, but, you know, I think it's worthwhile. And then I spend a tremendous amount of my time invested, you know, helping to run this and make sure that all the data is being collected properly. Yeah, it's, it, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> It is. Uh, having talked to some others, one of the things I had never even thought about was that if you move institutions, you're still, uh, that, that's your ID, it's not Cornell's ID, yes. it's yours. And you're and responsible. You are responsible. So if you move to a new institution, you're still responsible for a group of patients who'd be in New York, basically, or you know, with some of the other sites. And so that's a real and interesting challenge. Um, and continuing that kind of quality follow-up, which you're personally responsible for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, personally, legally. Legally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it, it's an issue. It is yeah. a, a major commitment that you make, and that y you are responsible for compliance, just like a company running an industry-sponsored trial. Uh, same requirements and, and regulations. And that was a real education. Yeah. Nobody really oh, teaches you how to do this. No, exactly. And yeah. nobody really wants to give yeah. you any help yeah. either. So you just kind of, it took three years to get our IDE application through and the trial up and running. And, and that's a lot of, you know, work product and effort to get that up and running. So I think that's why, if you look, that a lot of people say, yeah, we're going to apply for an IDE. But then in, in the end, you know, maybe only five to 10% yeah. of the people who say that end up doing it just because you need the funding and the resources and, and you got to make that, that real major commitment. So, Well, congratulations uh, to you and the entire group who've kind of pulled off uh, looking at all these fenestrated graphs. So, yeah, you know, collectively and individually made a huge contribution. I really appreciate it. So any final parting words, things you want to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I do think, and, and I presented some of that data today, that, that um, this concept of this research consortium, I think that's another interesting yeah. thing too. Because these are all, uh, you know, what I'm talking about is we've put together kind of this complex aortic or fenestrated and branched uh, uh, aortic research consortium. Um, and, and now we're in the process of actually securing funding and to have a uh, independent data coordinating center for all the centers where we can actually run our IDEs and make it easier for yeah, us to do yeah. that. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. But I think it's incredibly powerful because you saw powerful, that yeah. just in, a, in, a, in three or four years now, we're accumulating collectively series of close to a thousand patients that have been treated with these fenestrated and branched endografts, all with the same platform. And now we can get really granular data to advance the field by working together. So I think that that's an incredibly powerful thing. And, and, uh, and I think the other thing is for the, the people who are you know, training and trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. Um, um, for me personally, this has been great. And I think that you, know, you find something that you're interested and passionate about, and then you find some other people who have some similar interests. And by working together and collaborating, you can really do some powerful things. So, Don, thank you. We really appreciate you coming yeah. down. It's a pleasure. Trip Thank back. you. Thank you.